balance of macrolomia again remember it's a b cell neoplasm it's a tumor only it's a malignancy only but this is not made of plasma cells instead it's made of lymphoplasmacytic lymphocytes these are lymphoplasma cytoid or otherwise you can tell they resemble a lymphocyte typically they are going to resemble a lymphocyte which means these are nothing but lymphoplasma cytoid lymphocytes clear uh, that's what is a waldenstrom's macroglioma that's how it resembles okay now what are the features pathophysiology pathophysiology wise i told you it is nf kappa b driven here it's 90 percentage of the cases this will be having moid 88 mutations very very important if you take your uh, P pattern regression receptors prr chapter and you see i would have told this moid 88 i would have meant a word on about this valence of macrolomia in the future i'll be telling you. I, I would have told there itself moid 88 mutations are very 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 important 90 percentage of the cases you see this typically what is the mutation you see is something called l265p mutations which affects the nf kappa b pathway again clear we saw well i mean this thing isn't it this pattern regression receptors i told you wherever you do pattern regression receptors ultimately whatever tlrs you know, like you have tlrs you have clrs uh, all these things except the nlrp pathway you have tlr clrs everything and rig like receptors all these things are going to come to one common area that's called nf kappa b activation this you have studied nf kappa b activation you can go back and see the prr now because i told in a nutshell everything once it's activated they are going to activate the intracellular nf kappa b that is going to increase the pro inflammatory cytokines but remember only thing that doesn't work by uh, nl i mean uh, your uh, nf kappa b pathway is the nlrp nlrp is going to activate the pro caspase one to caspase they are going to activate the caspase pathway which is going to convert interleukin 1b to i mean inactive pro interleukin 1b to interleukin 1b so this is the pathway for nlrp nlrp doesn't follow nf kappa b pathway but whereas every other single thing is going to carry the nf kappa b pathway typically the tlr is dependent on an important adapter called MOID88. So that's why I'm telling you, because the N N MOID88 mutations, they are going to increase the NF kappa B pathway. That is NF kappa B activation will be seen in these patients. And remember this, this is not a feature of multiple myeloma. It's very important to know again, this is not and never a feature of a multiple myeloma. Similarly, uh, clinical feature wise, I can tell a lot of difference are there between plasma, I mean multiple myeloma and uh, Waldenstrom's macrolomia. But clinical feature wise, if you want to know the difference, first one patient will not have any evidence of bone lesions. Clear? Patient will not have any evidence of bone lesions. And patients typically will have IgM M spike. M spike will be made of IgM here. But why this is very important to tell this absence of bone lesions why i'm telling is uh, this point is very important because if the patient has bone lesions suppose let us assume if the patient has a bone lesion and the patient has an igm m spike actually this goes towards a multiple myeloma or simply you can call it as a igm myeloma so which means by definition you have an igm m spike and no bone lesions then only it goes towards waldenstrom's macrogonomy or in other words, you should not have any much crab feature. So this only will call Vattelstrom's and please, this is called IgM myeloma. That's why this is such an important point. No evidence of bone lesions. And uh, other features, you might get uh, this fatigue and you can get anemia or any other cytopenia, leukopenia, thrombocytopenia and all. Then you can get hepatosplenomegaly, you can get lymphadenopathy. All these things are due to tumor infiltration in the res respective areas. Tumor cell infiltration. So infiltration in the bone marrow can result in anemia and cytopenias. Liver and spleen may result in hepatosplenomegaly. Lymph node may result in lymphadenopathy. And again, this is a very important differentiating factor because multiple myeloma patients do not have that much lymphadenopathy. But here, definitely, they will have lymphadenopathy. Fatigue is common between both. That due to maybe due to a lot of reasons, especially anemia. Clear? And uh, hyperviscosity is much more common in 
multiple myeloma. I mean, uh, valence transverse macrolemia because it's IgM. Always I told you, IgM is the one that's going to produce severe uh, hyperviscosity because it's a pentameric molecule. So here it produces IgM. That's why hyperviscosity is more common with uh, your uh, valdez Stroms macroglobulinia compared to multiple myeloma, where hyperviscosity is seen approximately 15% of the patients. Hyperviscosity may have neurologic features like blurred vision, altered mental status, headache, dizziness, and all. Even they can cause stroke also or they can have cardiopulmonary features like shortness of breath. This shortness of breath may be due to either a congestive cardiac failure or it might be due to pulmonary infiltrates by this hyperviscous blood because they don't move out of the pulmonary circulation causing infiltrates within the uh, stasis within the pulmonary circulation causing infiltrates. So this is the reason why you get uh, cardiopulmonary symptoms, shortness of breath as well. Then they can cause something called type 1 and I mean I told you this hyperviscosity is due to IgM. Let us see other features of IgM. Excessive elevated IgM. Then they can get uh, your uh, type 1 cryoglobulinemia that is due to monoclonal immunoglobulin, not only due to IgM. Type 1 cryo is possible. They can get platelet dysfunction. Because of that, they can get mucosal bleeding, many of these patients. Then they can have IgM deposition that can result in amyloidosis and glomerulopathy clear IgM deposition may result in amyloidosis typically they deposit in the skin intestine and kidney skin, in, skin intestine and the kidney and they can also catalytic result in amyloidosis number five they can go for chronic autoimmune hemolytic anemia and peripheral neuropathy Typically, if you ask me why you should develop autoimmune immunity anemia because of excessive IgM, it's not because of excessive IgM, because this is an abnormal IgM, which means this IgM may act as an autoantibody. Autoantibody. This is one of the important things that you have to know. This I am telling you, this is not normal IgM. This is an abnormal IgM, which can actually act as an autoantibody, which can result in what? damaging the RBC and it can also result in damaging the peripheral nerve because this auto antibody can be formed against the myelin associated glycoprotein myelin associated glycoprotein clear all these things are I mean uh, reasonable in a multiple I mean the valence of microglobin remember the reason why you get this chronic autoimmune immunity anemia and peripheral neuropathy is due to sometimes auto antibody nature of this excessive IgM because it's an abnormal IgM not a normal IgM so they might act as an, because structure may be different, shape may be different, so they may act as an autoantibody. So diagnose wise, the most important thing for exams wise, if you ask me, multiple myeloma versus Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia in a nutshell. So here the neoplastic cells are the plasma cells. Here the neoplastic cells are the um, lymphoplasmacytic lymphocytes. It's not plasma cells. Then they don't have this MOID88 mutation, but it's almost 90% of the cases, they are positive for MOID88 mutations. Here typically very common is IgG followed by IgA. In fact, IgM is extremely rare. Here it is the monoclonal antibody, I mean uh, M spike is the IgM. But remember, both will have what? M spike. That is your uh, paraprotein will be more than 3 grams per deciliter. Here you have this crab features. Here, typically, you know, like the most important of the crab is the bone lesions. Here you have this bone lesions, but here you might have the crab features, but no bone lesions. Very important point, as I told you already. There are no bone lesions here. And again, lymphadenopathy, hepatosplenomegaly are very, very rare here, but very, very common. Lymphadenopathy and hepatosplenomegaly is extremely common here. And even if you see bone marrow biopsy, in bone marrow biopsy, you will see Aspiration more than 10% plasma cells that are infiltrating the bone marrow. These are neoplastic plasma cells. Here also will be there are more than 10%, but it's lymphoplasmacytic lymphocytes. lymphocytes. It's not your, uh, you know, like routine plasma cells. These are lymphoplasmacytic lymphocytes. Typically, remember, these cells are, uh, you know, like CD20 positive. 
again. These lymphoplasmacytic lymphocytes are CD20 positive. Very, very important. But both can be, remember, both can be again CD38 positive and CD138 positive. But remember, it is CD20 positive, whereas plasma cell, I told you, they lose the CD20 and it is CD20 negative. Whereas this LPL cells are CD20 positive. Again, very, very important point. So what are the investigations you can do for a Waldenstrom's macroglobin? Investigation wise, I'm going to do an SPEP along with the SPI to find out because it can tell you the paraprotein is more than 3 grams. It can show the M spike at the same time. This SPI also can tell the type of immunoglobulin that is typically going to be IgM. At the same time, they can also confirm this SPI also can confirm the monoclonal nature of the immunoglobulin. Clear all these things are SPEP and SPA's advantage. Remember, the 24-hour urine protein is not that useful because only 20 percentage yield here. There at least two, three, third dot will show this Ben Jones proteins here. Light chains are seen in less than 20 percentage. So urine protein, electrophores and urine protein, even fixation are not that much useful. At the same time, you can do a bone marrow biopsy. Bone marrow biopsy. As I told you, in bone marrow aspiration and bone marrow biopsy, there will be increased uh, lymphoplasma cell lymphocytes, more than 10 percentage in the bone marrow. And their immunophenotyping, these cells will be CD20 positive, CD38 positive, and there might be CD138 positive. Remember, beta 2 microglobulin levels are elevated in this disease also, which is again is a very, very powerful prognostic marker even in a Waldenstrom uh, macroglobinemia. And again, you have something called relative serum viscosity. You can use something called relative serum viscosity to diagnose hyperviscosity. This is a very important measurement in Waldenstrom's macroglobinemia, where you measure something called a serum viscosity and you put viscosity of water. Viscosity of water ratio. Normal is 1.8. This is a normal ratio, but in when you call hyperviscosity, this is especially useful for Waldenstrom because it secretes IgM. It's going to increase the viscosity. When it is more than 5 to 6, you call it as hyperviscosity. Very important point again. That's called relative serum viscosity, where you take a ratio of uh, serum viscosity to the viscosity of that of water. Normal is around 1.8. If it's more than 5 to 6, you can call it as hyperviscosity. And treatment-wise, the most important problem in these patients is hyperviscosity. That's what the problem is. But remember, here you can write as a difference also. Here, hyperviscosity is a very important problem because of the IgM. But higher hyperviscosity is generally rare. You get it, but not that common. Hyperviscosity. Hyperviscosity are going to do plasma exchange. As I already told you, plasma first is the most important. Then, uh, for symptomatic patients, you can use rituximab because these are CD20 positive cells. You remember multiple myeloma, I never open my mouth on rituximab because they are CD20 negative cells. You can't use rituximab there. But here, yes, you can use rituximab. Plus or minus, you can use strong chemotherapy with alkylating agents like bendamustine or cyclophosphamide. And you can use one more drug called alternatively, you can use ibrutinib. Along with that, you can use rituximab. This is also one of the currently approved therapy, NEGM 2016. Mentioned this uh, ibrutinib with rituximab combination. Please do understand where is that. I have told you this MID mutations are one of the main reasons for developing this uh, Waldenstrom. So ibrutinib blocks the MID88 pathway. This MID88 pathway responds very nicely to ibrutinib. Very, very important. And but before giving ibrutinib, I told you even though MOD88 mutants are common, 90% only show, which means you have to confirm the MOD88 mutation before starting ibrutinib. Very important point again. But definitely, if it's MOD88 mutation, they will definitely respond to ibrutinib. High response rate is there, and it's proven by many trials as well. So with this, we are completing the Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia.